Well, amen. I invite you to take out your Bibles and let's turn to John chapter 15. John 15, beginning in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Behold the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of coming together in your name, for being gathered together as your people. Lord, we pray now that as your word is preached, we pray that you would do what only you can to open up ears, eyes, hearts, and minds. Father, I pray that we would encounter you through this word. Pray that we would be shaped evermore into the likeness of Christ. Pray that we would be comforted and challenged where appropriate. Pray that you would be glorified through all that is done and said here now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're picking up where we left off in John 15, and we come this morning to what is another densely packed section. We are here in the upper room, or possibly working our way through the streets on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. Chapter 15 began the metaphor of the vine and the branches, which Pastor Josh then further unpacked for us last week as Christ called for his disciples to abide in his love and to have fullness of joy in their obedience. Here again, Christ reiterates this point, linking obedience and love, their obedience and love, to his own. Let's dive in. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. As Jesus has said in chapter 13, 34, here he says again, as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So we see here the love of Christ himself is the example given. It is the rule of life within the community of faith. Christ's disciples must love one another as Christ has loved them. As Jesus said earlier, it is by our love for one another that the world will know that we belong to Christ. And so we saw there that our love for each other, our love for the brothers, is meant to be one of the primary ways that we adorn our doctrine, that we make it look attractive. All right, so regardless of what disagreements the world may have with us, if they had the chance to observe us living together, they should see something attractive, something desirable. They should see a people who might not otherwise have much in common truly loving one another because of their common union with Christ. They should see a true family of faith, a people who bear one another's burdens, a people who weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And here now in this text, Jesus gives us the ultimate example of what this love ought to look like. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. 
Christ calls his disciples to love one another as he has loved them, and the ultimate display of love is about to come. Within just a few hours, Jesus is going to be arrested. Even as his disciples were prepared to fight to prevent his arrest, Jesus rebuked them and went willingly. Why? Because he loved his friends. He loved those whom his father had given him, and he loved them to the end. <clears throat> In his great love, Christ was willing to lay down his own life for his friends. For this was the means by which forgiveness would be accomplished. His death was serving a purpose. As Paul would later say, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was the sacrifice that took away wrath, our propitiation. He died in our place, our substitute, our sin bearer. He died so that we may live taking the penalty of sin on himself. Now this, of course, is the core message of the Christian faith, that which Christ has done for us, Christ's love for us. And this changes everything, it impacts everything. And in this text, what Christ draws out is the way that his love becomes the model for how we are to treat one another in the church. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And so Christ's own self-sacrificial love becomes the model of love that his disciples are to follow. So Christ gives greater detail. Right? What kind of love is he aiming at? Uh, what is this love willing to do for others? He adds now to the statement he had made earlier, gives a more detailed picture of what it looks like to love as Christ loved. And so we see that the radical call for Christians to model Christ extends to his self-sacrificial love for his people. Love one another as I have loved you. The life of Christ up to and including his willingness to die for his friends, is held up as the model of the Christian life in a variety of ways. Husbands are called to love their wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5, 25. Christians generally are called to die to themselves daily, picking up their crosses to follow Christ, and now in this text, we see the same idea applied to the church. Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. Someone laid down his life for his friends. Now this is a tall order. This is a very difficult calling. And it is one that our sinful nature will likely seek to avoid by trying to find any possible escape hatch. You know, our sinful nature, our flesh, can be very astute in finding creative interpretations and applications of biblical commands in order to avoid their full force. Right? Our sinful flesh hears a scripture passage, hears a command, hears something difficult, and it will bend and twist like a contortionist to avoid having the blow land where it ought to land. And so when it comes to the call to lay down our lives, one such escape hatch, one masterful dodge, can be for us to simply convince ourselves that these commands require nothing more than a single act of self-sacrifice. Right? Simply the belief that if faced with the opportunity, that we would truly, literally, lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters or for our wives, or for our children. But is that really all that Christ means? To literally lay down your life for others is a one-time event. Right, let's give a hypothetical story here. Imagine a man, uh, a church member, who never once showed any real interest 
in his brothers and sisters in the church. He never had anyone into his home. He never sought to encourage others. He never sought to disciple others uh, or to have anyone disciple him. He just showed up for church right on time and then left as soon as the words, you're dismissed, hit his ears. But then suppose that this man heroically tackled the gunman who had broken into the service, successfully subduing him, saving the lives of his fellow church members, but was shot in the process. Well, we would rightly regard such a man as a hero. We would honor his sacrifice. But here's a question. Did that man really fulfill all that Christ meant when he told us to love one another as Christ loved us? Right? Is that the full extent of what Christ meant, that we ought to lay down our lives? I would say no. A single act of love and courage, while commendable, is still just that, a single act. If this was both the first and last act of love that this man ever displayed toward his church family, I would suggest to you that he did not really follow the example of Christ in loving the brothers. Now, the same applies if we change the scenario to a home invasion. The husband does well if he sacrifices himself for his wife, if he lays down his life for his bride. But once again, if that is the only act of self-sacrificial love performed in their marriage, has this man truly loved his wife as Christ loved the church? Husbands, you say you'd be willing to die for your wives. Well, that's great. But will you live for them? Mothers, you say you'd die for your children. Will you live for them? Christian, you say you'd be willing to die for Christ. Right? If someone put a gun to your head, you believe that you wouldn't deny Christ. Well, that's great. But will you live for him? Will you honor Christ here and now, day in, day out? Will you love your wife every day? Treasuring her, caring for her, washing her with the water of the word. Will you love your children here and now? Being patient with them, disciplining them calmly, consistently, and in love. Will you love Christ every day? Will you order your life around what he commands? See, the, the kind of self-sacrificial love that Christ is after is not a one and done. Jesus doesn't call us to live for ourselves so long as we're willing to die for him once. We are called to die daily. Pick up your cross and follow Christ. To die to ourselves each day, to count our old man, our old way of selfish, sinful living, dead and buried with Christ. For we are new creatures with him. So brothers, do not comfort yourself with thoughts of what you would do when facing down the hypothetical gunman if you won't even stand up to temptation now. Don't flatter yourself with thoughts of taking a heroic stand for Christ if you are presently yielding to sin. You think you'd have the courage to stand up for Christ before Caesar? You don't even have the courage to stand up before him, before your co-worker. Jeremiah 12, 5. If you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? If you have been unfaithful in the little things, what makes you think you'll suddenly be faithful when the stakes are raised? You think you'd die for Christ? Start by living for him. Now let's grant for the sake of argument that you did take a heroic stand and died a martyr's death. You would then find yourself face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his full, unveiled glory. What thoughts will then go through your mind? 
After you've seen the risen, reigning, victorious Christ, right? The one before whom heavenly creatures are bowing and praising and worshiping, right? As you see what he is truly worth, truly deserving of. Now, we can't know what it'll really be like, but I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that in that moment, we may wish that we had died daily for him. Right? Having seen the fullness of who he is and therefore understood better his worth, we will wish that we had lived for him, that we had died daily for him, and not simply once at the end of our lives. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Brothers and sisters, look around. See Christ's blood-bought bride. See Christ's friends for whom he laid down his life. If you love Christ, you must love that which he loves. Christ loves his bride. Christ loves his church. Christ loves his friends. And so we must love Christ's church. We must love one another as Christ has loved us. We must have a mutual concern for one another. For when one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers with it. If you've ever really stubbed your toe, you know that is true. We must serve one another with the various gifts, resources, and abilities that the Spirit has given to us. We must all be seeking to build up our brothers. And truly, whoever you are, uh, whatever your stage in life, whatever gifts you have or don't have, you do have the ability to build up the brothers. You can be kind. You can encourage. You can offer warm greetings. You can pray. In fact, you must do these things. Christ requires it. This is my commandment that you love one another. May we grow to love one another as Christ has loved us. Let's continue on. Verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, at first glance, this text can seem problematic. For it might sound as though Jesus is saying here that their obedience to his commands is what grants them their status as friends. Right? As if they enter into friendship with him because of their obedience and therefore they get included in the group of those for whom he died. Right? That would be one way to read it, uh, to see if as a cause. Right? That would be one reading and that would be problematic. Right? That would be works righteousness. Supposing that it is our obedience that makes us a friend and therefore makes us a recipient of Christ's death. Now there would be dozens upon dozens of places we could go in scripture to show why that reading does not work. Uh, and as I hope to show you, we see very clearly just from this text alone why that reading does not work. So look with me to the text. Jesus says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, we just heard that language of command, commandment. Where did we see that? We saw it back in verse 12. Jesus has just mentioned his commandment, and the commandment he gave was that we love one another, and the key here, as he has loved us, right? As Christ has loved them, right? That's the commandment. So we ask the question, which came first? Their obedience to his command or his love for them? Well, the command itself has the answer in it. Love one another as I have 
have already loved you. Right? That's the command. The command is to follow the example of Christ's love for them, right? as he has already loved. And so their obedience to this command can in no way be seen as that which makes them Christ's friends. Their obedience to the command to love one another as Christ loved them cannot possibly be the condition that causes Christ to love them. Right? He loved them first. And so the command, love one another as I have already loved you. So then what do we do with this if in the text? We've seen that the immediate context doesn't allow us to read it as if it is our obedience that makes us Christ's friends. So how then should we read it? Well, there's another way that an if statement can function, and that is as evidence. For example, you are out of gas if your lawnmower starts sputtering and stalls. Right, sputtering and stalling is not the cause of your lack of gasoline, it is the evidence. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Or to draw even uh, from a little bit further back in chapter 15, a branch is united to the vine if it bears much fruit. And so we see this is not works righteousness, but again, this is a further description of the relationship between Christ and those whom he saves. The branches united to him will bear fruit. His friends, those for whom he dies, will obey his commands. Not to earn their way into friendship with him, but because of the great love which he has already lavished on them. Because being united to Christ, the vine, will produce something in all the branches. Because the Holy Spirit will give you new desires, will help you battle sin, and will show you the true path of life. The path where your joy may be full. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So notice here, Christ elevates the status of his disciples. He says, no longer merely servants, but now friends. Now, Scripture uses a variety of metaphors to describe our relationship to the Father and to Christ. A few examples we've covered in John already. Uh, we are described as the adopted children of the Father. Right? Christ grants us the right to become children of God. Right? In that analogy, in that metaphor, this would make Christ our firstborn older brother. Other places we are described as citizens in his kingdom, right, having been transferred from the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. We are even described as ambassadors, representatives for him. We are collectively described as the bride of Christ. And of course, I'm sure we're familiar with Paul's favorite designation for himself, which is doulos, slave of Christ Jesus. And so each of these descriptions teaches us something important about how we ought to relate to God. Now, of course, we are still Christ's servants, right? This language gets used throughout the rest of the New Testament, even after this point. But Jesus explains that the relationship between him and his disciples is different from that which was typical between a master and a servant. And the key difference that Jesus points out is this. A servant does not know his master's business. Right? A servant would simply do what he's told. Right? He doesn't need to know why. He doesn't need to know what his master is up to, what his purposes are. The servant just makes deliveries, fulfills tasks, does as instructed, without being told what his master is up to. 
And so Jesus says his disciples are not, no longer merely his servants. Rather, there is an elevation in their status. They are his friends, his confidants. For he has made known his business to them. He has revealed to them that which he received from the Father. Right? It is having this revelation from God that elevates their status from that of mere servant to that of friend. And I think this is a blessing that we can very easily take for granted. God certainly could simply tell us what to do and we would be obligated to obey. Right Again, just think of who he is, who we are, and the distance in between. He is God, our maker, our creator. Simply by virtue of that, we owe him everything. By virtue of who he is as God, we are his creatures and beneath him in every respect. What does God owe to us? And even further, through Christ, we have been given grace. We have been redeemed, been given a savior. So by virtue of being God and our God and Redeemer, he has every right to simply command us, simply require our obedience, but leave us in the dark regarding what his purposes are. And that's what most masters do. They won't, don't tell their servants their business. And so Christ draws out this element of how it is now different with him and his disciples. They are privileged. They are friends. For they are informed of his plans, his purposes, his motives. For us as well, <clears throat> God not only tells us what to do, but he has given us so many of the reasons why. We have this great blessing of revelation. God has shown us his heart proclaimed his purposes and intentions. Scripture is to us the revelation of God. In his great mercy, he has revealed so much to us so that we, unworthy servants who ought to regard ourselves as unworthy to even untie his sandals, are called his friends. We have received the fullness of revelation Right? We have now received in Scripture things which the angels were longing to look into for millennia. Do not take this blessing for granted. Verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, lest the disciples be tempted to uh, puff themselves up, right, in response to such amazing statements of privilege, Jesus reminds them that they are not here because of anything they have done. Carson writes, In the final analysis, his followers are privy to such revelations, not because they are wiser or better and consequently made the right choices, but because Christ chose them. I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Christ loved them. Christ chose them. Christ appointed them. The initiative belongs to him, and so the glory belongs to him. And the same is true for all who are in Christ. Who were you? Who are you now apart from the grace of God? Do you think you are in Christ because you are smarter or more spiritual or more godly than the next person? Was it something in you that caused God to choose you? No. Apart from the grace of God, we are all equally dead in transgression and sin. His grace made you alive. His spirit gave you new birth. And Jesus said, like the wind, the Spirit blows where he wishes. So Christian, do not boast. 
If you chose Christ, it is because he chose you first. If you love him, it is because he loved you first. And not because of anything in you. But it is so that your life may be unto the praise of the glory of his grace. Ephesians 1, six. And so what Christ said to his disciples applies to all who are in him. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now Carson argues that the language of being appointed here, as well as the emphasis upon going and bearing fruit, suggests that the fruit which is primarily in view is the fruit that emerges from mission, from specific ministry to which the disciples have been sent. He writes, the fruit, in short, is new converts. And we know historically that Jesus' disciples did go, and they have borne abiding fruit. It was through them that Christ built his church. In a very real sense, we here today are part of this fruit. For the apostles bore witness to Christ. They proclaimed the good news of the gospel. They made disciples who made disciples who made disciples, and so on. The Holy Spirit then used them and their companions and others whom the Lord would call to write the books and letters we now call the New Testament. And Christ's church has spread through the globe and will continue to do so until the world is as full of the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the seas. Habakkuk 2.14 Christ has equipped his church with all that they will need for mission. Christ promises to answer prayer. All that they ask the Father in his name will be granted. And notice again, this is not a promise of a blank check, as if prayer were a means to whatever sports cars or earthly prosperity we desired. But notice in this text the connection here to fruitfulness. Jesus says, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So you see this promise of answered prayer is given here in connection with the fruitfulness of the disciples. And truly to bear fruit in this way to see new disciples brought in is going to require more than what the disciples had on their own. For us as well, it is truly an impossible task that we have been given. To bear this kind of fruit, to bring, to make new disciples is something we cannot do on our own. But we are not left on our own. We have been given the invincible gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. We have been given the great privilege of special revelation from God in his word, and so are now called friends of Christ. And this word is sufficient to equip us thoroughly for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.17 We are given the Holy Spirit, who conforms us into the image of Christ, convicts us of sin, grants us new desires, interceding for us when we don't know what to pray for as we ought. We are given the promise that what we ask in Christ's name, the Father will do, that we may bear much fruit. And so we have what we need for this mission. For the Spirit of God works through the proclamation of the gospel to do what only he can, to raise dead sinners to spiritual life, To bring people who have been living life as enemies of God into the family of God. And so we have this reminder, even as we are seeking to live out this radical call for Christ-like love for one another, that we are never to become ingrown. While we must strive to become a close-knit family of faith, we remember that we are a family with a mission And it is a mission that will consistently orient us toward loving those who are currently outside the family of faith. As Carson puts it, 
the union of love that joins believers with Jesus can never become a comfortable, exclusivistic huddle that only they can share, close quote. Christ has other sheep who are not of this fold. He must bring them also. We must seek them also. Verse 17. These things I command you so that you will love one another. So just in case there was any doubt as to what this section is about, Jesus repeats it and explains his intention. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Christians must love one another. So brothers and sisters, do you love Christ's church? Do you pray for your brothers and sisters? Do you encourage them and build them up? Do you seek to help others grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? True love desires the best for others. And so, if you will love your brothers, you must desire to see them grow in love for Christ. And so you may be wondering, well, how, how can I do that? An easy place to start is to simply start by talking to them about the things of God. Right? Try to have conversations about deeper topics than just the weather. Speak to each other of what God has been showing you through his word. Ask your brothers how you can pray for them and then actually do it. And then follow up the next time you see them. Come join us in prayer and in Sunday school and midweek study as there are opportunities to learn and grow and fellowship together. Show hospitality. Spur one another on to love and good deeds. Build up your, the body and obey your Lord. These things I command you so that you will love one another. May we love one another as Christ has loved us. Amen.